to the St. Lawrence County Historical Association for our Brown Bag Lunch Program today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sue Longshore, I'm the Executive Director here. And I'm very happy to have you all here. I think most of you have found the coffee, which I actually turned on tonight. So I was <laughs> We do have a couple of restrooms in the lobby if anyone should need them during the course of the program. And I would be remiss if I did not thank all of the members of the Historical Association, as well as the St. Lawrence County Legislature and Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature for funding, helping to support all of the programming we do here, including keeping on the lights and the heat. So thank them all. Um, just a few announcements of some upcoming programs. This Sunday, March 24th, is our next Civil War Roundtable at 2 p.m. And Jan Bochik from Potsdam will be speaking on Charles Darwin in the Civil War. He did this program in January, but it was a very blizzardy kind of day. So we decided to offer it again for those who may not have been able to come out and get it. And a week from Saturday, that Saturday, March 30th, is the beginning of our genealogy workshop. We're doing a series of four workshops, four Saturdays in a row. So March 30th, April 6th, 13th, and 20th. And each week we'll cover different aspects of genealogy research and where to find information um, from 10 a.m. to noon. If you want more information, we still have spots available. You can sign up for all four classes or just you can choose the ones you want to take. Um, check with Cassie or I after the program. Our next Brown Bag Lunch will be the third Thursday in April, which is April 13th at noon. And we have Susan Millette coming from Burlington, Vermont, and she's speaking on an extraordinary, ordinary woman about the diary of Phoebe Orvis, who was a very early settler of St. Lawrence County, and she kept journals, including traveling from Burlington to St. Lawrence County in, I think, the 18, teens or 20s. So that should be a very neat program. I believe Susan has just written a book about that. And also, we have our antique and artisan show and sale coming up on Saturday, April 27th at the Canton Middle School from 10 to 4. And we have a lot of um, antique vendors and artisans with local handmade goods. We are also going to be having a formal luncheon. We're going to have an antique appraiser on site if you want to bring an item in to have appraised. We are going to have a few talks by some of the vendors about specific areas of interest. For example, I'm going to have someone who sells collectible Breakable collectibles is what her booth is called, and she's going to talk about our classic. So we can get some antique information while you're there. And we also have this beautiful quilt on the side of the room, which is being raffled off. So tickets are a dollar each or six or five dollars. And again, we have those available if you want to stop after the program. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Philip Page. He's a Madrid native who has a bachelor's in history and politics from Sudan Potsdam. Got his MBA from Syracuse University and currently is a realtor in St. Lawrence County as well as the co-owner of the Madrid Mercantile, which is a kayak rental and antique store in Madrid. And he's also one of the newer members of the St. Lawrence County Historical Association Board of Trustees. Here today to talk to us about the Ogden family. <coughs> begin by doing that. Uh, if you would like to become a member, if you not, are not already a member, there's membership paperwork on your way out. And uh, one of the best things about being a member is the quarterly, uh, which is this wonderful periodical that comes out by mail uh, four times a year that has absolutely phenomenal uh, local history articles. Um, I can't speak highly enough of the, the articles that come out in that publication. Uh, people who submit uh, the work is really high quality. Um, and I hope after organizing this into a presentation, it'll now be a little easier to create a quarterly article on the Ogdens and to add a bunch more pictures that we won't have time to, to cover today. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, as I uh, am speaking, feel free to, to chip in uh, with any information you have or questions. I'd like to kind of keep this uh, free flowing versus waiting until the end for any questions you have. Just a bit of a background as to how I got interested in this project. Um, as Sue mentioned, I've lived in Madrid my whole life. Um, I've been a nerd my whole life. I love old buildings. And I remember years ago seeing a picture of this mansion here, um, the Ogden Island uh, Mansion House, and hearing that it had been torn down for the creation of the seaway, which 
even as a little kid, I thought was a sin that they would ever tear something like this down. Uh, so as I would be doing uh, local history projects on other topics, it was almost inevitable that you would find some connection to the Ogden family. If you were doing anything early St. Lawrence family, the Ogdens were there in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so I started doing a little research without planning to actually do something like this. Uh, but then one day, uh, the archive god, Jean Marie, uh, let me know that uh, we have a diary from one of the Ogden family members, uh, Charlotte, and you'll see a picture of her coming up in a bit. And I was like, oh, why did I see this? And I became totally entranced by this diary. Um, Charlotte, as I'll read some of her uh, uh, diary entries, was quite a character. Um, so I really became interested in the family by way of getting to know her through her diary. Um, we have like more than three decades, I believe, of diary entries of hers of what it was like living in at the time when Madrid was 10 by 10 before we divided in 1859, early Madrid, early St. Lawrence County. So I feel like I got a window, window into my community uh, through her eyes. So I was pretty excited uh, to find that. But to get to Charlotte, we have to go back a generation. Uh, I want to first begin uh, with Abraham, and let's see if I can get the technology to cooperate here. I hope. Do I need to hold it? It worked last time. It was a little delayed. Point at the computer or the screen? Another shot, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think maybe if you point it at the screen instead of computer, that might be it. <laughs> or maybe it's not. This is the this thing. Is it working? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got Abraham. Yeah, you had it working. Yeah. Yeah, um, we have a point that I'll be very honest about it. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Everything is mysterious, but not quite this mysterious. Okay. Maybe is that working? Is that working? No. Okay, well, Abraham will come up in a minute when he's ready. Um, Abraham and Sam, who we'll talk a little bit about after, uh, were brothers. They were the son of David Ogden, who was uh, a colonial uh, figure from the, the British, when the British were still running uh, the colonies. Uh, he was a member of the New Jersey Supreme Court. They were uh, loyalist gentry uh, down in New Jersey. But among David's, or not David, Abraham's generation, he and Sam were the two patriots of the family, but three of his brothers uh, remained loyalists throughout the war. Um, so after the war was over, uh, and we retained control of, of the, the land up here, and I'll talk a little bit more about that process, um, Abraham and Sam were the first ones of the family to invest in the region. Um, Abraham, primarily in what we now know as Madrid and Waddington, he bought the, the 10 by 10 um, mile parcel there. Let's see if it comes ready to come out, maybe. Oh, I just saw a little um, spinning thing. <laughs> it's, it worked for a second, right? Back here. And I got it accidentally before. <laughs> Isn't technology funny? Anyway, he'll come up eventually. Um, so Abraham invested in what was Madrid, that 10 by 10 parcel, and his brother Sam in a tract of land over to the western side of the county um, in what was the what was now Oswegatchie. Um, Sam was an interesting fellow, and I didn't plan to talk much about him, but I found some new stuff yesterday, of course, as you're doing things like this. You have your uh, kind of your script written out, and then you find something new, and that goes to the wind. So I do have to tell you a little bit about Sam, and specifically the Ogden's connection to larger early American figures. So Sam actually uh, was a colonel, and he got roped into a project to help liberate Venezuela. Um, oh, oh, there, there it is. is. <laughs> <laughs> Better late than never. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so this is Abraham. But Sam, Sue, if you want to go one more. Sue, can you go one more to Sam? I know what you did. However, you got that. Part. Okay. So Sam, I don't have a picture of, but I do have a picture of his indictment. So Sam, Sam was in, indicted uh, with the co-conspirator uh, for violating the neutrality acts 
for helping or attempting to help uh, liberate Venezuela from uh, Spanish control. And it turns out, uh, as a result of the depositions and the various facets of trial, that he and uh, his co-conspirator said that he was actually doing this on the orders of President Jefferson and Secretary of State Madison. Mm. Much like our current political climate, <laughs> those individuals deny that and refuse to appear before the jury. Uh, so we don't necessarily know uh, what truth there is uh, to that, but uh, they were both eventually acquitted on the on the charges of, of violating that act. Um, so I, I had no intentions of talking about that, but when I found that out yesterday, I'm like, oh, I have to read that talk about that. Uh, so the other connection to early America, um, and I'll get into him more in a second, but um, it pertains to Jefferson, so I'm going to speed that up a little bit. Um, Abraham's son, David, uh, who actually lived in the Island House, um, he was appointed by the Federalists of the House of Representatives after the tie in the 1800 presidential election to go interview uh, the two finalists who were actually of the same party. They were running mates. Um, but because they tied, those were the two folks that went to the House of Representatives for the decision to be made. Uh, it was between the name you may recognize, Aaron Burr, mm -hmm. and President Jefferson, the fellow who became President Jefferson. And uh, Ogden was appointed to go interview these candidates and see if they could come to terms, otherwise known as making a deal. Mm -hmm. So you appoint my friends to be ambassador, to be this, that, and other thing, and we'll give you our votes in the House. Um, so. Mind you, the two candidates that were the frontrunners at this point were not Federalists. So the Federalists were trying to decide who was the lesser of the two evils. So, um, mind you, and you'll know this, so Hamilton and Burr and their little duel which resulted in death, of course, um, David Ogden was Hamilton's law partner. So he was appointed by the Federalists to go interview Burr. Burr apparently were, had refused to come to terms. So he reported back to the House to say that of the two options, he believed that Jefferson was the lesser of the two evils. The Federalists, um, some decided to abstain, some decided to vote in the affirmative, but it was enough for Jefferson to become president. So, uh, kind of relates to that every imaginable thing I've studied relates to the Ogden somehow, and Je President Jefferson, even becoming President Jefferson, relates to the Ogden. <laughs> so, after, shortly after um, Samuel and Abraham had bought the land here, one of the challenges that Sam faced over in Ogdensburg was when the Native Americans who had remained loyal to the British um, were trying to decide where they were going to go following the conclusion of the war, um, they had sold a portion of the, their land, this was the Oswegashi tribe, uh, the northern section of the, the river, they had sold to the British so that the loyalists coming to what was now Canada would have tracts of land available. They did so in exchange for the British building them a village at what we know as Point Airy, which is where the St. Lawrence Psychiatric Center is. So they built 23 homes. Uh, each home was designed to house two families. Um, and there was a central street. They had glass windows. There's lovely descriptions of how this village was set up. Um, but when Sam Ogden uh, either came or had somebody come and inspect the land and discovered that there was this Native American settlement here, in addition to the fact that the British were still occupying the fort in town, um, he wrote a letter in protest to the British to say, A, why are your troops still here? B, why is there a Native American settlement that you created still on this property? So, subsequently, um, by the Jay Treaty, the British agreed to leave um, the territory on this side of the river, and at the direction of local officials in 1806, the Native American settlement that was on what they had called at the time Indian Point was pushed off. So these Native Americans who had remained loyal to the British were kicked out of um, this country. And from what I've been able to read, it seems that uh, some went to the Onondaga Reservation and some went to the Eastern District of the, um, the St. Regis Reservation. And again, uh, in connection to the St. Regis Reservation. When the treaty was being discussed as to how the Natives would cede the land in Northern New York, the American appointee to discuss that treaty none other than Abraham Ogden. So he was George Washington's appointee to that commission. So there's one Ogden involved in it, but there's actually two. The Attorney General of the State of New York at the time was Josiah Ogden Hoffman, who was a nephew of Abraham. So uh, 
it should appear as a conflict to A, have two members of the same family negotiating this treaty, but also to have that family own a significant amount of land in this region. So they have a vested interest in the treaty going a certain way so that their land is more valuable, they can settle there, they can make more profit. Uh, so hopefully um, that wouldn't pass the smell test nowadays, but certainly as I'm reading that, I'm like, wait, so there's two members of the same family negotiating a treaty on land that they own and stand to profit from if this goes the right way. <laughs> Slightly concerning um, in that respect, but. For what? Yes. I have read of lots of things that go that way. Yeah. <laughs> I still do. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are lots of things like that. <laughs> In all different aspects of our culture. Mm -hmm. And as unfortunate as that is, but it, it seems to still be happening today to some extent. Right. Sure. Yeah. But conflict, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Um, so now we can kind of start going into the next generation. So Sam Ogden never actually lived um, in this area. Um, he used his land agent, Nathan Ford, you may recognize the Ford name, Ford Street Hackensburg, you can tell a whole other presentation on Nathan Ford. Um, but he never actually lived here, neither did Abraham. Abraham died actually um, pretty soon after negotiating the treaty and buying the land. Um, but his sons, um, David A. Ogden and Governor Ogden, um, both actually lived in the community. They were the first of the Ogden family to move here. Um, and what's kind of interesting about the name Governor, you may think of Governor Morris. So Samuel Logan, to go back to him again, he was married to, I believe it would be pronounced Euphemia Morris, so Governor Morris's sister. So there used to be a street in Ogdensburg called Euphemia Street. I think it's maybe State Street now. Um, but again, another Ogden connection, so another founding father. And Governor Morris himself actually invested um, in large tracts of land in San Lawrence County as well. So. <coughs> David um, didn't actually live here full time right away. Um, he, though he was appointed the county's first judge, he actually, based on the diary entries that I'll get into in a little bit, spent still a significant amount of time in New York City and New Jersey. Um, but Governor seems to have moved here with his wife Charlotte um, and stayed full time, with the exception of maybe traveling to Montreal or something like that. They, they were full time residents. Um, so the, let's see if I can get this to look again. Maybe. Oops, to turn on. Oh, look at that. Okay, so Governor, we do not have a picture of him, uh, but there's a picture of his uh, tombstone. He was a surrogate judge um, in San Lawrence County, so dealing with wills and estates and things of that nature. But it seems that for a time at least, he was the family's representative to the local community. He was the one who was managing the property, managing the businesses. Um, and Where is he buried? Uh, Troy. Okay. So we can okay. talk about this in a little bit, but by the end of the story here for this generation of the audience, they kind of lost their fortune, and Charlotte and Governor both moved to Troy to live with one of their children, and they lived out the remainder of their life um, in that community. <coughs> Let's see if I can get this to go. So this is my friend, Charlotte. <laughs> I feel like I've spent a significant amount of time in it. Um, the really interesting thing about her diary, in my perspective, is it seems to have been a family affair. So she would write an article in her handwriting, another member of the family would review what she wrote and make notes on the side about what she was saying. So I'm going to give you just one example of that that I, I think is kind of funny. So this is from July the 1st, 1818. Uh, Charlotte says, uh, sent a large pail of peas to the island, marginal note, the first fruits of the garden. The bridge broke away, the bridge between Ogden Island and the mainland. Uh, so that we cannot go, ever, go over except in boats. Another marginal note, beginning with an X. Oh yes, mother, a man might wait over. <laughs> <laughs> another X, so another family member. Um, G. Ogden, governor, expected from Montreal um, this evening. Another marginal note, this is in Charlotte's hand. Or a woman either. I believe she was referring to when her son, I imagine, wrote. Oh yes, mother, a man might wait over. She's saying a woman could do that too. <laughs> so there are consistent examples of this as you be reading through the diary where it, it just becomes like a family dialogue. So that was kind it's like of, a text thread. Yeah, exactly. It's like reading the Facebook. Uh, right. the um, so the Ogdens, um, in terms of living arrangements, if you're familiar at all with the way that uh, Waddington is set up, the, um, the house that Charlotte and uh, Governor lived in originally, that they referred to as the Elms, 
Um, if you were on St. Lawrence Ave, right by where the hardware store is, there's a beautiful brick house there. Um, it's not the original, but their house, the Elms, sat right on that corner. I think it's um, might be Clinton Street that comes down there, so it's right at the corner of Clinton that and was, St. Lawrence Ave. That was Ave. Bruce Hansen's house. Yes. Yes. Yep. yes. So that's where they lived originally, and it's kind of fun because she apparently did not like this original house. So as I'll uh, pull up with the house that they ended up living in, let's go to this one first. So we have no actual pictures of it because it burnt down in 1843, which is a miracle that lasted that long because in the two decades I've read through so far, I think there were six different house fires there. Where she talks about, well, chimney fire here, had to redo this room, and the gable uh, burnt off. So this house was um, designed by um, Joseph Jacques Rame, a, a famous French architect, who also designed the footprint of Ogden Island and how that farm was set up. Um, and their property as well. He also designed um, Union College down in uh, the Albany Capital Region area. Um, and I hear, I haven't seen it yet, but I hear they have the blueprints to this house down there. So I want to go and check that. Um, yes. Yep. They have. Yep. So they have this collection down there. So where was this house? So this house, um, the roads are a little different, so it's it's somewhat harder to explain. This was on the mainland. Um, and it was going toward Ogdensburg a few blocks, so there's um, uh, Clinton Street, and there are different names now, but it was like the third block over and it took up the whole stretch. Um, there's an early map of Madrid, the whole town, so when it was the 10 by 10. And towards Ogdensburg or towards? Towards Ogdensburg. Towards so you'd still be able to see the island house from there, but this was a little bit um, further up the river. Um, and it sat kind of on the hill <coughs> looking out. So the Based on that early map that I've seen, it looks like they took up the equivalent of what would be three village blocks for this oh, wow. um, state. So it was, yeah. it was quite large. It was 70 homes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this, it was originally a 70 acre parcel that the house sat wow. on. Yeah. Um, yes. So the, the fun thing about um, Charlotte moving to Ellerslie, I have three days of entries where she talks about the process of packing up the elms, which she hated. Um, and we'll see. <laughs> and moving to Ellerslie, which is what they call this house. And they call the Ellerslie because on Charlotte's side of the family, on the Seeky side, um, they were Scottish um, elites, and uh, Ellerslie Castle in Scotland is their family home. So this was named in honor of um, the family home. So she says, on January the 7th, 1820, the family have all departed. Here I do sit, all sol solitary and forlorn, in the midst of dust and heaps of rubbish, just about to take wing for a purer atmosphere. O coal, O dear smoke, farewell. I pray thee, remain where thou art. If sorrow, <laughs> carry thou also. I fly on wings of joy to Ellerslie. So she was clearly very happy to be moving uh, to this new home. And you can just, as you're reading this, you can just feel the personality that this woman had. So another thing that characterizes this early period of time in the, um, the 1816 to um, 1820 range, you progressively start to see David and Rebecca Ogden spend more and more time in Waddington and spend more and more time at the Island House. So if we go back, just one. So this is the Island House. This was on Ogden Island. Um, and you can see the cupola up on the top there. Um, there aren't many pictures that have that. Um, that burnt off when the Crafters owned uh, the island and owned the island house. So Philip, this says circa 1816. Is that when it was built? Yes. Okay, this obviously wasn't a photo of it. Yep. 1816. Yeah, this would have been... 1860s yeah. or 70s? Yeah, well, yeah. well after that. Um, and you can see... I might be able to use my little laser pointer. That little lighthouse. So that, mm -hmm. people have told me they think is for doves, or raising... Oh, oh, oh doves. Yeah. 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 okay. Yeah. So you can see they had made additions, and this was when the Craftsers had owned it. Um, this section here and this section here are two new wings that they built in the same stone, but it originally would have been that square footprint. Um, so it's an interesting, a few interesting things about the house itself. Um, in the basement behind the house, there were brick rounded vaults. And some have speculated, and I'll tell you why, I don't think that's true in a little bit, that this was part of the Underground Railroad. I don't think that's true, but hard to say. Um, so the walls of this house were three feet thick, and they entertained incredible 
dignitaries here. They, it seems like on a monthly basis, the Attorney General of Canada. Yeah, so November 27, 1821, the Attorney General of Canada paid a visit to the island. Um, and they themselves were um, Episcopals. They started St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Waddington, which was built from the same uh, limestone. So when you come to the that four corners there, you look to your right, the church stands as it was built. Um, but they seem to have been very good friends with a Father Salmon, uh, who was a Catholic priest. And all the time you see Father Salmon spent a weekend at the island house. So they didn't seem to have, uh, at least from in the, within the Christian faith, any religious qualms about mingling with, with others. And they talked too about um, a Presbyterian will give a sermon in the church. So they kind of uh, shared that building with people of other uh, faiths. And she talks a lot about, Charlotte talks a lot about on Christmas, how each of those big windows would have 42 candles in it, and you would drive by in your sleigh and it would just look beautiful. So, <laughs> it paints a nice picture of, of what Washington must have been like uh, in that era. Philip, on the religion question, isn't Charlotte Seton Hagen somehow related to St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, who's a Catholic saint? There's yes. some connection there. Yes. I, um, I think not by blood, it was an in-law, but yes, oh. in, within that family. Um, in a different generation. But yeah, I think, okay. wasn't she the first American who became Saint. a Catholic saint? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, Ogden connections? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not an exaggeration, to say the least. Uh, and it was kind of fun as I was doing this research, uh, doing real estate stuff, I do deed research for some of my clients who have older homes. And especially if you live in the footprint of what was the original Madrid, everybody's property goes back to David Ogden. Mm -hmm. You find that deed, and that's just so hmm. cool to say, well, I can tell you when. David Ogden sold this parcel, how much he made, so <coughs> fun connections there, but I'll stay out of the real estate rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few other entries I just want to uh, touch on uh, quickly that I think have fun personality to them. So we can fast forward to 1824. Um, so Charlotte is living in Ellerslie at this point, and uh, sounds like weather very similar to ours right now. So this is February 4th. She says, after a thaw, Snow disappearing very fast, rains every hour, quite mild as yesterday, thaws fast. Here's the fun part. Stacks of hogs rooting up the old grass, no less than 30 around the tree under my window. <laughs> what a nuisance. Underlined. Rather go without ham, underlined. All the days of my life. NB, whoever NB is, uh, I don't know. That's the only time I saw those initials referenced. Mm -hmm. Let them loose to glean, I take, to save feed. What an economical master they have. Mm -hmm. Give him credit for it when he comes here next. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's going to get a chew in for that. <laughs> so again, fast forward just a little bit. Um, this is from 1825, and this isn't in Charlotte's hand, and this handwriting you don't see very frequently. So. I have a suspicion that it's Governor Ogden himself that writes this, and it's of political nature, so um, I, I think that that's quite possible. So this is October 26, 1825. Flags hoisted, cannons fired, and great rejoicing in the village in celebration of the meeting of the waters of Erie and the Atlantic. A boat passed through the locks, handsomely decorated in honor of the day. God bless DeWitt. So that's in reference that's to cool. uh, your Governor DeWitt Clinton and the Erie Canal. So uh, the, 1820. 1825. Yeah, another one in 1825, and this one, as a Madridian, I found kind of significant. Um, Charlotte says, G. Ogden, gone to grass, meaning Madrid, what we know as Columbia Village. Um, and I say no new spelling. This 1825 is the first time she spells grass the way we spell it now, rather than just grass that you find on the, the yard. So he was gone there to look for ore. And he ended up finding pig ore on the shores of the Grass River, right. which he then used to start a foundry and to start manufacturing iron. And just as we were beginning, Peggy Murphy here showed me a picture. She has a water feature in her garden made from an old, what would you think hog it was? Kettle. A hog kettle. <laughs> and it says G.O. Waddington. So chances are Governor Hogg in Waddington. So you can imagine how old that would be, wow. and the fact that it's still in great shape is... It's in great shape. It's got a slim crack, but it's up high enough mm -hmm. that I can keep the water feature going. Yeah, I think that's so cool. <laughs> All right, so let's go fast forward a little bit. So here's the thing I was mentioning. Um, I had always heard that the Ogden were involved in the Underground Railroad, which, if you hear that your whole life, you have no reason to believe it's not <laughs> true. 
But one thing I found consistently was that the Ogdens had quite a few slaves. Mm -hmm. So this was even before I found the diary, I was in Marie's help. I'm thinking, okay, why would somebody who is allegedly involved in the Underground Railroad have slaves? Mm -hmm. At a time where there weren't many slaves um, in the community. Um, Has Louis Hasbrook, who was the first county clerk, um, he was over in Ogdensburg, he had a number of slaves, but when you look at the, the slave census, it's Hasbrook and Ogden fighting for um, first place for the number of slaves they had. Mm -hmm. um, and I found, just by kind of happenstance, there's a, a lady who has a, a blog online, she does um, history as well, and she did a, a really interesting piece on the Ogdens and their slaves in New Jersey. It turns out that she is a descendant both of Abraham Ogden and his slave Lucy. Oh. So you can draw some conclusions there. <laughs> but in, when you look at Abraham Ogden's will, it lists the slaves by name, and Lucy has a child at the breast at the time that she was to be wow. sold off. So that very well could have been one of Abraham's children. Wow. So without any evidence, it's hard to say, but it makes you wonder how many of um, David and Governor's slaves were from the family and maybe were related to them. Wow. Um, impossible to know at this point unless I find some hidden letter or great diary entry that I have missed so far. But um, what I'll tell you, I, I have a question. Yes. Is there any differentiation between slaves and indentured servants? The uh, slaves were they mentioned as non-white? Yes, they were. Okay. Yeah, so the, the article I'm going to, or not the article, the entry I'm going to read in just a moment is the only one I have that refers to them specifically by race. And they wouldn't sell indentured servants. No, no. Say again, ma'am? They wouldn't sell indentured servants. No. Yeah. 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 I don't think their services were sellable. No. Yeah. Previously, we didn't mention selling anything. That's why I asked oh. indentured servants. Oh, right, because they were just listed as his. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and sometimes, in, in some research, sometimes the differentiation is difficult and it's, it's vague. Go ahead, ma'am. No. Oh. I just wanted to add, though, that if there are living descendants of these people, mm -hmm. DNA tests could very truth. likely bring this out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what this lady had done. She mm -hmm. had done DNA tests to yeah. find that she was descended from both, mm -hmm. both of these two families, mm -hmm. um, which I think is super fascinating. Mm -hmm. but, um, the, the other variable that um, came into play, so in New York State, through the Gradual Emancipation Act, um, slavery in New York State was to end in 1827. So mind you, the date of this um, entry on that read. March 22nd, so think about what today's date is. Was this the 21st? Yeah. So however many years ago, tomorrow, 1827, um, Charlotte says, Father, who she, when she refers to Governor, sometimes she says, Father, Father sold the two blacks for $200, a pretty good bargain. Had a very melancholy parting, rained, had the first thunderstorm this year, quite severe. So the year that slaves were to be emancipated in New York State, um, Governor and Charlotte were selling theirs. So personally, I have a hard time believing they really had <laughs> underground railroad <laughs> connections if they were waiting until the very last minute to sell their own slaves. And certainly, Maybe within the family there was some disagreement, so maybe the, the folks who lived at the island at that time, which would not have actually been um, David and Rebecca, um, David died in 1829 um, on a trip to Montreal. And after he died, Rebecca kind of fell on hard financial times, so she moved to the mainland, and David and Governor's brother Isaac bought the island. Um, so perhaps Isaac had different views on slavery and had determined that he wanted to participate in this, but I have no evidence of that. And just based on this, I find it hard to believe. Could be wrong. Maybe I'll find something later and it'll change that perspective. But um, as of right now, I don't see uh, any evidence to that effect. Um, the other thing that I found kind of interesting that relates um, to, to slaves, I was wondering, would there have been a separate graveyard for them? Would they, or would they have been buried um, in the, the town cemetery? Well, it turns out in asking those sorts of questions, I discovered there was a family cemetery on the island itself. Um, and when I spoke to Rough Strait and a few other people who had lived in Waddington at the time, they said when the seaway was coming through and they tore the island house down, tore the barns down, tore the other houses up there, that they never actually disturbed the ground of the cemetery. They took the stones, the headstones, moved them to the mainland, 
and left bodies. And again, whether or not that's true, I don't know, I haven't dug down myself, but I'll tell you, I did kayak out to the island um, this last summer, and I found, based on looking at the map, there's a section probably 30 by 30 of a field stone fence, and within that fence there are four or five cut limestone blocks. Like that would be the base for you to set a headstone. And then there's one uh, sandstone, red sandstone uh, base as well. Um, and there are depressions in the ground, but I'm not digging. <laughs> and no desire to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but one of the one of the connections, again, um, back to slavery to some extent. Um, Rebecca Ogden's nephew um, was up living with the family when the Civil War broke out. He ended up going back to the South, which is where Rebecca Ogden's family was from. She was an Edwards from the South, so she had a dowry of 27 slaves when she um, married her husband. So he ended up fighting in the Civil War on the Confederate side and dying. And on his uh, tombstone, I wish I would have uh, copied the inscription down, but it was something to the effect of, in the hour of my friend's need, I couldn't leave them behind. So he had gone to fight with his friends and family in the South on behalf of the Confederacy. But his stone is in Waddington. Whether or not he's there, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but So the stones that came from the island cemetery are now located, if you're looking at the front of the Episcopal Church, uh, where the main door is, to the left. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of smashed up in a rough shape, so pretty hard to, to make things out there. Um, but David and Rebecca are buried in Brookview. And I found their vault, which was quite a, an experience. Um, if you're looking at um, Brookview Cemetery from the road, and you can see like over where Dick Mann's house is um, on the other side of the water, well, they just sold it, so Dick Mann's farmhouse. Um, along that um, hedgerow, the trees have come out about 30 feet, and that forest that you can't even access because it's so filled with just scrub brush and junk, that's where the Ogden vault is. So you go down, probably four or five steps, and there's big iron doors. And if you look at the big stone up above the doors, you can just make out that there was writing there. So I went, like a true nerd, and uh, did journal writings. So this is actually edited slightly, in that the, the letters are much further apart. The piece of stone is probably as long as, as this um, projector screen. So I had to do one letter, move it over to get it off, and then one page about Ogden. And then 1829, which was the year that David passed away, and then I got um, his first name. Mm -hmm. so that wow. that section of the cemetery is in pretty rough shape. So if you live in Washington and pay taxes there, please encourage your elected officials to maintain the cemetery. History. <laughs> um, that and actually, in that section of the cemetery, um, the Chipping family is buried right there. The Fenton, Jason Fenton. Um, so the early elite is in that section that you can't even get to. So it, it's kind of interesting. If you can break through the old scrub brush there, you'll find some uh, pretty interesting things. So if we go back really quickly just to um, Ellerslie. So in 1843, um, Charlotte and her husband were at church and heard screaming out in the community, and it was to start a bucket brigade because their house was on fire. Uh -huh. So the family left church, went back home, and found that the house was, it was too far gone. So unfortunately, um, in 1843, Ellerslie was declared a total loss. Um, <coughs> added to that misfortune was the family, Governor Norris family, had fallen on financial hard times already. So you see them in 1850 in the census in Lisbon. I don't know what that was, who they were living with, or if they were renting, or what that um, arrangement was. But that's the last time you see um, Governor and Charlotte in the North Country. They moved from there down to Troy to be with one of their children. Um, and it's funny because you find more letters from Governor at this point, so when they're living in Troy, and he refers to his wife as a tyrant. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat jokingly. So he, he's writing to one of his other children saying, you know, we're living with your brother now, and uh, your mom is giving him a hard time about how he's managing the household. <laughs> but you know she's a tyrant, so. <laughs> oh, dear. He, but in other letters, he refers to her very lovingly and seems to have really held her in um, great affection. Somebody who is not held in great affection, based on some other letters that I've seen, is Rebecca Hopkins. So when she moved to the mainland and became an older lady, uh, you find 
numerous references to her being a very miserable person. Um, she was not nice to children. She uh, would sometimes smack people with her cane. Uh, <laughs> so I don't have any diary entries of her. I don't. I don't feel like I have a window into her soul. But um, just based on what I've read of others perceptions of her, she doesn't seem like the type of person that I would have wanted to spend my time with. Um, but going back to, to her farmer house, so after, um, as I mentioned, her husband passed away and she moved to the mainland, um, Isaac took over the house, and it wasn't until the 1880s that the Ogdens sold that to the Crapsers. The Crapsers moved there and they owned it until the, the seaway came through and the house was destroyed. Um, was there a bridge to it? Yes. So to some extent there were two. There was a causeway at the base of, is it Clinton? Right now, yep. Where the, yeah, so. Right by the harbor store. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So the causeway went across there, and she references that when she says that the, the bridge went out. Yeah. So over the causeway, there were two small bridges. Um, that in other pictures, you can kind of see where the water had gone through. Hmm. But It may be seasonal. Well, to some extent, yeah. if the water was high. But the they had a dam. Um, further downriver slightly from there, which is where the mills were. So that uh -huh. generated power for um, early industry in Wellington. Um, and there are interesting lawsuits um, later in the century about who actually owns the water rights. Yeah, so you find some interesting takes on, well, the, the original deed stipulated this, but actually when the original deed was signed for um, the Ogden parcel, they didn't really know who would own the island, whether it would be Canada, or whether it would be in the states. But another variable to consider with um, specifically David and what I found on him, it seems that he and his brother benefited from the fact that some of their family were patriots. Um, a lot of their international business was with, um, in the provinces of now Ontario and Quebec. And he actually, like I mentioned, he died in Montreal. So they may have benefited from their proximity to the border and because they had such tight connections with um, colonial uh, authorities in uh, what was then uh, Dominion of Canada. So, um, yeah, it seems like they milked their, their connections for their business for sure, but um, hard to judge that. I uh, read somewhere at one point that when the Crapser family was trying to preserve their property during the Seaway, they had pretty good standing to, to hold on to it. <coughs> but where the state came in and got them is that they had never, that the Ogden family did not have any permission to build the bridge or the causeway to the island. Mm -hmm. And that was the, like the straw that broke the camel's back and allowed the seaway to come in and take the place. And that doesn't surprise me based on what I was reading in these court documents as to mm -hmm. who actually held the water rights. If the first lawsuit was well before the seaway. But it, it seemed to present a pretty weak case um, for the Ogdens actually having the authority to, to do that. Um, so that that's kind of in line with what I've heard before. That's interesting. Yeah. I think their connection to Montreal goes all the way back to their land office because they had a, an office in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And they had the And that makes sense, and there was another connection. So one of um, Abraham and Samuel's brothers was the Chief Justice of the um, Quebec Supreme Court. So they had, <laughs> it's, it's starting to level of connections that they had. And one of the older orderlies, and I don't know which one it was, there's um, a Quebec Supreme Court that was Diana, there's reference to... Um, and I think in that, it tells about going to Montreal, when they stopped in Montreal. I mean, that's where I read it. The house that your sister and brother-in-law live in, um, on St. Lawrence Ave, mm -hmm. Charlotte writes on January 5th, 1829, um, moved land office to the village at W.O.'s, and I believe that that house was William Ogden's. Mm -hmm. So that's the day that they started using that stone house on St. Lawrence Ave. If you're familiar at all with St. Lawrence Ave going toward... Um, was it Whitaker Park down that way at the end of the road? If you're going towards Whitaker Park, you'll see a, a beautiful stone house with a gambrel roof and a circular window. That was the land in <coughs> the Ogden's land office, which was also owned at one point by William Ogden, uh, which is now the 
straight slip. So. You mentioned that Ogden had a few Tory brothers. Mm -hmm. What happened to them, do you know? They were very successful in Canada. Uh, I was wondering, did they come back and link up with him after settling their differences? And I never found any evidence of the ones that moved to Canada <coughs> moving back. Um, well, I meant with him, did they hook up and use those connections uh, from the Tory Ogden? Oh, probably. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have connections to the American elite, if you have connections to the Canadian elite, if you're right on the border, you're very well positioned to kind of know on both sides. And it's interesting from the perspective of the War of 1812, um, <coughs> David and Rebecca weren't living in Waddington full time, but they were up in the area when there was a few searches. And uh, David writes back to his mother, kind of fibbing a little bit, oh, there's nothing to worry about up here. There is no fighting, uh, no threat. Um, but uh, there were instances of uh, some fighting in that area, but he was able to maintain his connections uh, to the, uh, the Canadian and British forces on the north side of the shore too, to have a kind of a non-aggression pact that he wouldn't get involved with Americans up to no good, and they wouldn't get involved with doing anything to, to his land holdings. And that was consistent. Um, there is other examples of that in the county, specifically in Hogginsburg. There's a certain book uh, written about the War of 1812 in San Lawrence County that talks about a few other kind of non-aggression pacts between certain folks who lived on this side of the border uh, and did business with folks on the other side. So, um, always connections to the Afghans, even back to the war. Um, but they, they kind of petered out in this area. Um, I would say from between 1840 to 1880 was really their decline in this region. and Many members of the family had left already. It's funny though, if you go on a Wikipedia tangent and look at members of the family down through generations, um, I think it was Catherine Hepburn married in Ogden for a period of time. And it, it, it's like you can't make this stuff up that every generation of these Ogden have bizarre connections to certain things. Um, uh, do you folks have any other questions? They had more than two slaves, what became of the others? Do you know? So there's no reference in Charlotte's diary to anything other than that one transaction. Um, she, she refers, there's one, one um, page where she talks about the inventory of clothes that they were buying for the people working on their property. Um, and it's the only time she refers to names of people who worked for her, and only first names. So the thing that makes that interesting, if she had somebody from the community come in and just do a specific project for her, she always referred to them as Mrs. So-and-so, full name, Mr. So-and-so, full name. But the, that list of, of people is just first name only. So were those the list of the names of her slaves? Maybe. Um, that, I believe, was 1818. So that was a decade prior to having to sell their slaves. So they may have had more at that point. They may have kind of whittled that, um, that down a little bit. Um, but she talks about having to buy them clothes and um, pay for their shelter on the property somewhere. Um, so if we'll ask talk, I'd love to know, but um, she really doesn't speak much about that. It is interesting, she did fire somebody. I think I have reference to that. Um, certainly if you're from the Madrigal Warrington area, you know the, um, the Dolly family. And there is, she fires uh, Miss Mary Dolly. Ah, here we go. So um, August 17th, 1822. Um, Mary Dolly was just discharged paid her in full eight dollars. Certainly not, underscore, twice, too honest. So it makes you wonder what Miss Mary Valley had done. <laughs> um, and while I'm reading from these, there is one other thing I just kind of thought was interesting. This, um, in Mazur, we have the Haskell Cemetery down past um, Wayne's gas station, and that's where part of the original settlement of Columbia Village was, the Haskell family. And she references, um, so this is March 27, 1819, um, the same day received from Samuel Haskell $20 and gave him a receipt for the same. This is funny. O tempera, O mores, composed of banknotes, crowns, dollars, half dollars, quarters, uh, pistorines, and cents, to my great annoyance. <laughs> Marginal note. And then this looks like it's in Governor's hand, not for getting gold. So uh, you can imagine that the folks who had bought land from the family coming to make their, their mortgage payments and being met. We didn't really have standardized currency, and people were using all sorts of different things, like <laughs> historines and uh, <laughs> just kind of dumping it out on the table saying, it's all there, $20 worth, have fun. <laughs>
but she really seemed like she would tell. I, uh -huh. I really greatly enjoyed going through uh, her diary entries, and I still have probably another 15 years to go. Uh, I fast forwarded to... Your 15 years or her? <laughs> she, she only writes, um, I would say, a few times a month. So if you do move relatively quickly through there, the problem is she'll reference somebody or some event. <coughs> well, I, have, I have to go research this now, so you, it takes 43 it's years. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Okay. So the archives upstairs, that's where we have the, um, the diary. How did the archives get the diary? That's a good question, Jean Marie. Do you know? No idea. There You're is really <laughs> there's an Ogden collection of uh, paper in uh, Bar Harbor. What connection there is there, yeah. they hold a lot of um, Governor and David's personal um, communication. So one of these days, I'd like to go and see what they have. Um, and they also make reference to a diary there, too, but I can't get an answer from them as to whose it is. That's not our permission. I always wondered if um, Ogden, Utah was named after one of the Ogden's. It is. <laughs> And there is another uh, um, very famous because it's from Torrey Point. It's near yes. there where the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific. There's an Ogden Bill in the Simpsons. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> They're everywhere. Yeah, that is there's a, and, and that was one of the rabbit holes I had found out one time I found out they had a connection to Ogden, Utah. Yeah, that rabbit hole I went for a day. <laughs> so what about Ogdensburg, New Jersey? I would not be surprised based on the fact that that was the family's home base. Yeah. Um, but I haven't personally done any research on that. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if it were. I would be surprised if it weren't connected to them somehow, being that that was um, their personal neck of the woods. Um, but uh, yeah, there are a bunch of other research directions I would like to go with this. The um, library in Ogdensburg has a number of other communications um, from David Ogden to Louis Hasbrook. Um, but they're harder to get to, and they're protective of their collections. So I still haven't wormed my way in there. Not right, people. Patience, I'll, I'll get there eventually. Philip, do you yes. know how much land Ogden's in general owned up here? I tried to look it up this morning, and I got so, so overwhelmed I quit. In terms of acreage, I, I can't tell you, but um, Abraham bought that 10 mile square of Madrid. And then Samuel's tract, which was over in the Oswegatchie area, um, was even larger than that. Um, but they invested through the Ogden Land Corporation in a number of other pieces of property. So it would be a great challenge to quantify um, what their original land holdings were. Well, our, we have some up front. Our um, Morley Harrisons mm -hmm. were connected with Ogden's. Yes. In fact, some of their kids were David's, David's um, daughter married one of the Harrisons, mm -hmm. and they moved to Canton, I believe. And of course, Harrisons were here in Canton, so. Yeah. Like I said, I have every connection in there. I'd love to find somebody locally who's related. But, uh, John Austin. <laughs> yeah, John Austin, are you related to the Yes. Philip? Yes. May I mention uh, the reference to Ogden that is in the John Purvis diary mm -hmm. that I Absolutely. sent to about? Absolutely. Um, my ancestor was John Purvis, who came from Scotland in 1819 and had several children. And uh, his diary is here in our archives, too. Uh, he references that as soon as they landed, uh, he says, Mr. Ogden, so I don't know which one, but he landed in Washington. And the children were sick, so he says, uh, it was so good of Mr. Ogden to uh, take care of my children find medicine or whatever. And then he says, plus, the very next day, he offered me a job to be his gardener. <laughs> so that has been the family tradition uh, that um, my ancestors were the gardeners on this island property. Huh. And so they never had to uh, migrate any further inland. They, they got the job job because, because of his beneficence <laughs> to them. It's funny. And it's, so the other thing worth mentioning, especially about this house, so when the house was torn down, it seems like everyone in Waddington owns a piece of the Ogden's. <laughs> I hear, so the Dickie Mads old house, the railing in that house came from this mansion. And in my quarterly article, I'm going to include some pictures from the inside of the mansion. You can actually see the railing leading up to the mezzanine. 
Um, there are fireplace mantles that were made of marble that came from the mansion that ended up in town. Um, pieces of furniture. I used to have sideboards from the ovens that I sold, which I regret every day. Um, <laughs> I should not have sold that. That was kick myself for that. But um, actually, the people who live on the footprint of where the elms, the first house of Charlotte Governor, they now have uh, a quilt that was owned by the Ogden family. It's really amazing as I've been doing this research. Somebody will tell me, oh, we have their such and such, or oh, we have their such and such. Whether or not all of it is true, I don't know, but it's, it's kind of fun that the, the community has held on to their heritage in that way. We're approaching, oh, well, actually north of 200 years. Um, and it was interesting to see when Russ came here to present, uh, he had a video of the day that they moved the wrecking ball to the, the house here, and he talked about how his father couldn't watch, he had to leave town that day. So we didn't actually get to see the wrecking ball hit it, but he talked about it being three hits, and it fell in on itself, and um, that was that. So the day I went over there to find this cemetery, um, I thought I was going to be a ghost there because when you're standing on shore looking over at the island, the waves didn't look too bad. Oh, I thought I'd just fine. I run a kayak rental business. I don't need a life jacket. I'll be fine. The wind was blowing one way, the waves were going the other. I got halfway there and I'm like, well, if I'm going to go anywhere, it seems fate that I would go here. But it was interesting because if you go, um, during the portion of summer where the water is relatively low, you can still see where the stone fences were under what is now underwater, where the pastures were. Um, I found a bunch of flow blue pottery pieces out there that I helped and took home. Um, I'd love to go over there with another detector. Um, but I even brought over a few of the, the cut stones from roughly where the mansion was that I have in my garden now. So I have a little piece of the mansion in the garden. But, so you have a piece too? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, and I, I hope to go, like I said, go over there with a metal detector someday. It's still owned by the Power Authority, so it's public land. You can go over there and explore. Um, there's a huge open cardwood maple forest over there that's it's stunning. Well, by the dove house. They raised doves? So this would have been when the crafters were there. So possibly. Um, the they were used for as uh, communications as well as meat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they used to raise those too. Mm -hmm. Like homing pigeons? Yeah. Same as the homing pigeons? They could eat, you could eat them, you yeah. could raise them. They used to have bell oh, braces. Right. Oh, yeah. And as somebody said, you could communications. And if living on an island, that might be handy. Yeah. 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 So yeah. actually, that, the structure where the doves apparently have yeah. is this is the only picture I can find that exists. Um, oh, if you're, so if you guys are on shore right now looking over at this yeah. angle. On the side that the, the dove building is, there were also two large barns that were partially stone, the same sort of stone that the island house was built. And there, I've not been able to find a close-up picture of those structures, but even from a distance, they look absolutely stunning. Um, it, it's just a crime of shame that all those buildings were torn down. But those, the first two stone barns were also designed by uh, Rene, so I'm sure that they were architectural wonders in and of themselves. Um, I think if times were different and I were alive and there were no nonsense, I'd be changed. Oh, for my day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. 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 So before the true way, mm -hmm. that island must have been much larger mm -hmm. than what we can see. I, I'm understanding that about 40% of the island is now underwater, yeah. or totally underwater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it, it was. Um, and then another thing that was kind of interesting, referencing the Erie Canal, prior to the Erie Canal coming through, the importance of this shipping channel in the early period was even more so. So it's kind of interesting that the Ogdens were celebrating this new means of inland transportation when it very likely hurt their <laughs> values up here because if people were investing down there now and that was going to be the, the new thoroughfare, ah. this shipping channel was going to lose its luster. Um, so I, I thought from that perspective it was interesting to hear them celebrating um, that. So, do you know if anything remains of the causeway? There were a lot of businesses on the causeway, a lot of different kinds of like a blacksmith shop and all different shops along the causeway. Yeah, really? So the causeway didn't have the businesses, it was the no. dam just a little further down from there. Oh, so, it looked to me on the side. Yeah, when you, when you look down Main Street, it was extended almost directly from Main Street, and you can even see in some of the pictures the stone buildings that were still there at one point. Um, but 
the, the causeway itself was just that, the one that was at the base of, of the Phillips Street. Oh, all right. Yeah, but no, there are sadly no remnants of that. Yeah. I wish, and there's a section of, when you are kind of looking at a satellite image of Washington, some of the area that um, Governor Australia lived on is still woods. I'd love to kind of tell her through there to see if you can find the foundation of their mansion. Mm -hmm. um, but trespassing is illegal, so <laughs> <laughs> I would never do such a thing. Like yeah. that. <laughs> there are witnesses to the contrary. <laughs> yeah. You got lost. Yeah, exactly. I got lost. <laughs> uh, huh. so, How many farms were on the island? At one point, three. Two, oh, so three? the craft. Originally, it was just often. When the craft stores were there, the Portises were also on the island, and there was another small farm um, on the downriver section. Hmm. So at the point that the island was kind of torn apart, there were three. And uh, I think the Portises may have actually owned the second one as well, but three separate farmhouses were on the island. Yeah. And there were other islands, too, that were in Waddington that are no longer in existence. Now, but so who owns it now? The Bridging Port Power Authority. Power Authority. Power Authority. Power Authority. So maybe someday uh, there'll be trails or something to, to make this a little more uh, hospitable. But right now it's um, cow pastures. I believe it's faux bears that um, they take a ferry over there with um, their cows. So it is eventually that there are still open pastures. Well, if anyone else has any further questions, feel free to talk to me after. But I want to thank you all for coming. This was a lot of fun.